Hello, this is Michael Hartle from the Ruby on Rails tutorial at railstutorial.org. And this is a special advanced setup screencast to show you um, how to configure your environment for a, a more pleasant and powerful Rails development experience. A lot of this is specific to OS X, and uh, quite a bit of it is specific to my particular setup. When I say advanced, I mean it. If uh, you're not an advanced user and you try to follow these steps and find that they don't work, uh, don't say I didn't warn you. Uh, I should also note that this is not a standalone screencast. Uh, there are all kinds of little details that are very difficult to cover in a screencast like this. So uh, you should use this in combination with the section on advanced setup in chapter three of the Ruby on Rails tutorial book, uh, available as a PDF or online. Our first step is going to be to create a sample application for uh, our configuration. So let's do that. Go into the Rails projects directory and do Rails new. And I'm going to skip the, the bundler step because we're about to change the, uh, the bundle uh, or the, uh, the gem file that bundler uses. Also saves us some time. Let's open up the uh, files in uh, Sublime Text. We'll be talking more about customizing Sublime Text later on in this screencast. Let's first uh, go to the gem file. Uh, this is the default gem file. I want to replace this with a very particular gem file. Let's go take a look at that. Uh, there's a gem file uh, online at its bit.ly slash rails tutorial gem file. Oops, it could not find it. Is it bit.ly? Oops, I mistyped it. There we go. And there it is. So with it, that bit.ly URL does is uh, redirects to uh, a URL at GitHub. So this is the, the gem file that I'm going to use. Uh, don't use the gem file that you see here. Use the gem file at the URL because these version numbers might change. So let's replace that. And now we need to install things. I'm going to type bundle. Um, if you get an error here, you can do without production. Um, there is a, a gem here, there's the, the PG gem for PostgreSQL, and uh, if your system isn't configured with PostgreSQL, if it doesn't have it installed, then uh, you'll need to do without production, but mine, my system does have it, so I'll just type bundle. All right, so bundler is done running. I'll close down the gem file. At this point, we're going to, uh, as a first step, eliminate the necessity of typing bundle exec in front of commands. This is an annoying thing that happens in uh, current Rails development. Uh, because of the way bundler works and the way it packages up gems, you have to type bundle exec in front of things. So we're going to get rid of that, that uh, requirement. And the way to do that is as follows. We just want to make sure we have the latest version of RVM. Now we want to uh, change the mode of a particular uh, of a particular hook. And then we need to uh, we need to run bundle again with a, an argument bin stubs equals dot slash bundler stubs. And there's one more step we need to do. We need to add that directory to the dot get ignore. At this point, we can type things like rake without 
typing bundle exec. So for example, to do uh, break db migrate, we can just type this. Of course, this is a blank sample application, so that didn't really do anything. But uh, in general, this can be uh, quite a nice time saver. Of course, you can also just uh, write like a bash alias, alias bundle exec to be or something. But this is a little cleaner. I should note that if you install other executables, um, you'll need to rerun uh, bundle install. Bundler stubs consists uh, of all of these executables, and so if you add a new gem such as guard, which we'll be doing later in this screencast, you'll have to run this again. Just if you run bundle install, it'll add uh, the executable to this to this uh, directory. By the way, when I say run bundle again, what I mean is with specifically with uh, with this argument. You'll have to do that again. Now we're going to install a way of running tests in an automated fashion called guard. If, let's take a look at the gem file. You might notice that I, I already have guard installed here. This is guard rspec in the development and test group. Uh, so in order to configure guard, what I'll have to do is uh, type guard init rspec. So let's do that. I don't really understand this. It, I, I'm, it's annoying that it doesn't just work, but we just went to the trouble of the limiting bundle exec. Now it's complaining. So let's try this. As part of this, we should also configure our system to use RSpec. So we need to do Rails generate RSpec install like that. Now, running uh, guard uh, init RSpec creates a guard file. We can, we can look at it here. Now, in order to configure this properly for the Rails tutorial, I recommend going to uh, chapter three of the Rails tutorial book and copying um, the, uh, the additions to the default guard file. Now, this is just a blank sample application, so this doesn't really do anything for us yet. Um, I'm going to do a couple more steps, and then I'll switch over to a completed Rails tutorial sample application to show how these things fit together. The next thing we're going to do is to install Spork, which lowers the overhead required when running tests. So let's take a look at this. We're going to actually run guard with Spork at the same time. So guard and Spork work nicely together. I'm going to comment uh, or uncomment these lines. And I'm also going to use Growl. This is going to uh, work only on OS 10, and you do have to have Growl installed. Uh, and then on OS 10, there's this uh, there's a gem for FS event, which is a file system event. We'll see in a moment uh, what this does for you. So let's un let's uh, save that. There we go. Now we need to bootstrap Spork. Spork bootstrap. Now let's take a look at the spec helper. It says bootstrapping the spec helper file. Spec helper. And the key here is to move this stuff, which is the, the rspec environment uh, loading step, and put it inside this prefork block. And actually, I should have shifted it over first before I did that, but let's shift it over. Uh, this is all this the overhead that happens whenever you start up uh, an RSpec uh, environment or a Rails environment as part of running RSpec tests. And so what Spork does is it only runs it once, and then it doesn't run it any other time. And then on uh, future invocations of RSpec, uh, the overhead has already been paid. You've already started up the Rails environment, and things run a lot faster. We'll see in a moment exactly what that means. All right, let's take a look at a working sample application. I'm just going to go down back to this sample app, and this is the actual completed version, sample app second edition. And I want to take a look at the uh, the dot rspec file for this. So let's open it up in Sublime. This is the dot rspec file. It's actually just in the home directory. Take a look here. It's in dot uh, rspec. 
uh, not the home directory, sorry, it's, it's in the Rails root. It's in the, the directory of the application. Um, so you can see that we've got it configured to run color. Um, our spec speaks British English, it seems. Um, actually, it works either way. You can do this. Um, and then it has DRB, which stands for Distributed Ruby. And this is the flag needed to run our spec with Spork. So let's take a look at how that works. Let's run our spec. Let's time it. No DRB server is running is an indication that we're not currently using Spork. There we go. It took uh, 11.9 seconds. So let's let's run a Spork server. The way you run a Spork server is just by typing Spork. So Spork is ready, and let's take a look and see what happens. There we go. So it starts up right away. There we go, you can see it finish in nine seconds. Now, that might not seem like such a big deal, uh, but it can make a big difference when you're only running like one test at a time. We'll see an example of that in just a moment, but first I wanna show how guard works. So let's, uh, let's shut this down. In order to use guard with Spork, what you need to do is run bundle exec guard init Spork. And what this does is adds a particular line to the uh, the guard file. Let's take a look. Um, so what it did is it added this line at the at the bottom for guard, and as it turns out, I already had that in here because this was configured for guard. But it's important to take this and then move it to where. Uh, to where it is above this guard R spec stuff. So it's already there though, let's just save it. Close it down. It is annoying that I have to type bundle exec there, I don't really understand that. It didn't always give me an error message, but in any case, we've got it working here, bundle exec guard, and we because we have that configuration there, it automatically runs spork. And you can see here, it says spork, our spec successfully started, and now it's running the tests. And it gives us our results here, is a little growl notification. So now, what good does this do you? Well, let's take a look at it. Take a look at the user's controller here. And I'm gonna make a change, and I'm just gonna do a space and then backspace and save it. See what happens. Look at that, our spec results, 48 examples, zero failures. So one of the cool things about guard is that it will uh, run the test based on the, the file to change. So let's take another example, look at the user, and let's go over here and, and look at the user spec. So if we do, do space backspace just to get a change there, there it goes, 47 examples, zero failures in the bottom right. The same thing over here, we can, let's just uh, let's do this. I made a change that actually broke it, so that we've got a bunch of failures now, and let's undo that change. So you can see how this is uh, really great with uh, a test-driven development setup. You can uh, make a test over here that fails, and then you can go over here and make it pass. And it's really nice to go back and forth. Uh, it's not my favorite way of doing things. I'm, I'll about to, I'll, I'm uh, going to show you how to how to, how to do something even finer grained. But this is a, a, a nice setup, and I really like the way Guard is, uh, is easy to install and configure. All right, I'm gonna shut down Guard here and start up Spork. And I wanna show you this, uh, this one final uh, configuration. Uh, this is a way of running tests inside of Sublime Text. Uh, in order to uh, set this up on your own system, you can go to a, a, a page that I've set up uh, dedicated to this. Let's take a look at it. Uh, 
And this has some instructions on setting up uh, Sublime Text in the same way that, that I have it set up for the screencast series. There's a lot of stuff here, but the thing I want to focus on is Ruby Test. If you follow this, you can see the Ruby Test package. So Ruby Test is really cool. And let me show you what, what it, it gives you at the end of the day. Uh, it gives you these, uh, these commands. The, the, the most important commands are running a single Ruby Test here, running all Ruby tests from the current file, and running the last Ruby tests. I really like these, so let's take a look at what that does. Let's just run all the tests in this file. There they go. We can run just this one test. And over here, we can run the same test. So let's see how that might work with uh, something like uh, responding to uh, password confirmation. This is part of the has secure password method that's new as of Rails uh, 3.1. So let's uh, let's comment this out over here, has secure password. And I'm going to run this test. See one example, one failure, because there's no longer a password confirmation. In fact, let's, let's run all of the tests. You can see there are just a ton of failures to do that. And we can go over here and uh, uncomment that save it, and now we can rerun all the tests. So this is a really great workflow for test-driven development. What you do is you go over to your first panel, you uh, write a failing test, then you go over to your second panel, you write the application code, and then you rerun the same test. So um, you do Shift-Command-R to run a test. Let's comment this out again. You do shift command R to run a test, and you go over to the other panel, you write the application code, in this case I'm just going to uncomment it, and then you just rerun the same one with shift command E. So this is a great workflow, and uh, it also shows how important Spork is, because if you're running just one example at a time, without Spork, you pay the full overhead. So let's uh, kill Spork, get back to our, our flow, Oops, save this thing. You can see it even tells us no DRB server is running. That's because of the .rspec file that has dash dash DRB. So you pay that overhead every time. You go over here, you write your application code, rerun the same thing, and it's the same overhead every time. So Spork is such a great tool for this. If you're running Spork, then that overhead is uh, essentially nil, and you can get into a great flow with your test-driven development. And there we go. That concludes the advanced setup for the Ruby on Rails tutorial. If there was anything here that wasn't clear, uh, please consult uh, chapter three of the Ruby on Rails tutorial book. And if you're still stuck, then I recommend uh, the old standby doing lots of web searches. Um, I wish it weren't that hard, but it really is. And it took me many hours to get my system configured just the way I wanted it. Uh, so if uh, if you run into trouble, uh, persevere. This is something that everybody runs into when they're doing software development.